Welcome to News Exchange 2021. It is great to have you here at this virtual session. My name is Sasha Vakulina. I'm Euronews Business Editor, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating this upcoming session. We really, really hoped with the team here to have you all here with us, but you know the situation, how it is, and safety comes first. So here we are. We are producing, until the moment that we can finally all meet in person, we are producing these sessions to keep the conversation going and to foster this dialogue to keep sharing our knowledge and so we can all keep learning from each other. We are bringing together now for this next session, which rather will be a conversation, the two most influential people in the news industry. The companies and the brands they represent have become the synonyms of news. It's my great pleasure to introduce them here to you, to everybody who is following us and joining this session. Alessandra Galoni, editor-in-chief at Reuters. She's the first woman to lead the globe-spanning news agency in its 170 years history. Hello. Hi there, thank you for having me. Great to have you here. And Julie Pace, senior vice president and executive editor at the Associated Press. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Both of our guests started their current roles this year and they will share their thoughts on taking the helm and where they are heading. And for everybody who is here with us virtually following this session online, on Zoom, elsewhere, please do ask your questions. I'll give them and I will post them to our speakers, our guests, by the end of this session or in the middle. You can do that in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Please join in the conversation. That's the whole point. So we can all share our experiences and questions and learn from each other. And until I get to your questions, let me start with this, Alessandra and Julie. So both of you are at your current roles uh, since a couple of months. And as for the industry that, as we know, doesn't sleep and doesn't rest, let me ask you this. What's your experience? How is it going? And is the news cycle is something that's still existing or it's rather the thing from the past? Alessandra. Well, it's a never-ending cycle, I would say. Uh, so it's certainly not uh, a, a news, uh, something from the past. Uh, and of course, you know, you are talking to uh, two editors of two global news agencies. And so for us, certainly, the news never stops. Uh, and, you know, I think the trick for both of us is, you know, we cover the news globally. And one of the challenges is how to bring global news and make it relevant uh, for audiences locally everywhere. So to answer your question, news cycle is as busy as ever. It is a global one. And uh, people around the world are more interested in it globally. Julie, is it busy? I would busy? agree with that. Yeah, is it busy as ever? It's, it's as busy as ever. And I think certainly the pandemic, I think, has helped do exactly what Alessandra has talked about here, help us uh, bring different stories from other parts of the globe to audiences elsewhere. We're all living, no matter where you are around the world, we're all living through one story. And that's really unique. We, I, it, it's really hard to think of another time in recent memory where we've all been experiencing a, a version of this one story. And so I think it's really helped us connect the dots for our audiences, amplify pieces of this story from different parts of the world. Uh, you put uh, different frames on them. We've been really focusing here at the AP in particular on the inequality of the pandemic, looking at the ways in which vaccines have been getting to uh, poorer countries, uh, the way that richer countries have been handling this uh, versus those poorer countries. And, and I think trying to, again, tell this one story in this in this global way um, has been a challenge. Uh, it certainly has made it um, a 24-7 story uh, in the truest sense. Um, but it's also been really invigorating because, again, I can't think of a more important story that we've been covering in recent memory. Yeah, and it's going on now for almost, it's been almost two years of these busy times. Yes, and I don't I mean, know when it's going to end. I mean, we're still living, exactly. we're still very much living in the pandemic right now. I think we all probably thought, Alessandra probably feels the same way as we were thinking ahead to 2022. I think we were probably thinking about almost a post-pandemic uh, coverage plan. But I think that you know that's getting pushed further and further down the line. I think that is still going to be very much part of our focus for early 22. And then eventually the story will become how the world really does emerge from this global pandemic. 
Yeah, Alessandro, sorry, I interrupted you there earlier. I mean, I think we're all looking forward to, to that moment when we're going to finally say, yeah, that happened in the past, you know, when it comes to the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, look, just to echo Julie, I think we clearly are not uh, out of the pandemic. Uh, I mean, in Europe, uh, just to name one example, you, we are starting to talk about lockdowns again and severe restrictions on the uh, freedom of, uh, of, of people's movement uh, and, uh, you know, and, and work as a result of the I can't remember now what wave we're in. Whatever wave we're in, it's a big wave. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, we have the the uh, waning effect of the vaccines, which is now playing a part in this new wave. And, of course, the booster shots, uh, you know, have not uh, have not been uh, uh, given, administered around the world. And, of course, let's never forget, and this speaks to what Julie was saying, that there are many parts of the world that still don't, have not even had access to their first vaccine and their second vaccine. So, you know, to echo again what Julie was saying, the the unequal, the inequality of the pandemic is still very much a theme. I think at the same time, what you have is that you do have an important economic story, though, that is developing. And, you know, economically, if you look at big parts of the world where there has been an economic recovery, what that looks like, and then what does the world look like when you start to uh, pull back on those huge recovery measures, on that huge injection of cash that was given into the economy. That is also a very live story right now in, in many parts of the world. So then, of course, there's the pharmaceutical aspect of the story. You know, these big companies that have developed the vaccines, much work is being done now on a development of some sort of cure, for lack of a better word, or in, in any case, some, um, uh, some, you know, medicines. And that is also another part of the story. So you still have the, you have the pandemic part of the story and what it means uh, on the, on people's lives and on policies, government policy. You have the economic story and part of the world coming out uh, of sort of the economic doldrums, but what that's look like, the economic and financial policy story. You have the pharmaceutical story. But again, you know, really to, to agree with Julie, how this is affecting the lives of people around the world is very unequal. And that is something that we have an obligation as journalists to record. Let me ask you a little bit more about the economics and the economic aspect and bring you more a little bit to the news industry. Because, of course, with this story has been dominating the uh, the news media over the, it's been already two years now and you know we're still here and there are so many other aspects that you've just said two of you uh, with how busy it's been in the industry nowadays and with so many stories happening not only on the pandemic but also all the other aspects of it and the different stories we still see some uh, lots of media quite struggling when it comes to their business and their economics uh, we see more newspapers, local outlets that are forced to close the shop. Big companies are still surviving, yet they are facing great cuts in their budget. I want to hear your take on what are those industry actors, our colleagues, what are they going through? And how is the situation, how you, the way you see it there? Well, look, I think this is still an industry that is very much in flux. It has been for some time, and in some ways the pandemic has exacerbated a lot of the challenges that many news organizations were facing, particularly those local news organizations that are so vital around the world to telling the stories of their communities. I think that the, the challenges you know, that we have seen uh, certainly have forced closures in some uh, local outlets, staffing cuts, uh, but in other cases, some really creative measures to try to ensure that the news is still being covered. I think that you know, we're going to be in this period, though, of flux for some time to come. And I think the challenge that we all have here is to be thinking not just about how we get through the next year, next six months or the next year, but to be thinking about where we're going to go in five years. It's not just the industry you know, that is that is changing. It's our audiences that are changing, where they're getting their news, what their expectations are of the news that we're delivering them. You know, digital, uh, we've been talking about this a lot you know, at the AP, Digital is not, 
you know, the future digital is where we are now. So we have to help our customers. We have to help their audiences access the news in the way that they expect to get it. That means being more visually focused. It means, you know, thinking about the person on the other end of the, of the news, how they're looking at that on their phone increasingly, how they're looking at that on the screen, as opposed to, you know, on a physical newspaper or even increasingly on a, on a nightly broadcast. So I hope that out of this situation will be will come great ideas, great creativity. I think that you know, news organizations that have survived these types of moments often come out better than than where they started. Uh, but I think that we we should be honest about the difficulties that the industry is is facing. And again, I do think that that's going to be the situation for some time to come. Alessandra, what's your take on that? What do you see as this uh, model for the future for the industry for the media and? You yourself had the transition when it comes to Reuters in April 2021 when you switched the model for the website when it went from the B2B model rather to uh, B2C. What do you think about this model of the future for, for you for the transition? Yeah, well, first of all, I would just pivot off something that Julie said, which is she started, and I believe in this myself, is that the pandemic really has exacerbated trends that already existed. And I think that is an important point if you want to look at the context here and also at possibly where we're going uh, into the into the future. Clearly, the pandemic and for many news organizations gave a, a bump, right? Everybody needed to know what was happening in the world. They needed to know things like, where can I get my vaccine? Which vaccine? You know, what, what should I, you know, how many people are dying around the world? But the trends that already existed and that were exacerbated are, I would say, a couple um, the sort of big, big picture trends. One, I would say, is the technological one, and that is that you know the the t technology, which includes, for example, social media and the speed at which news is propagated uh, right now, is is something that we have terms with. You know, technological change and the platforms have allowed the companies, the individuals, the institutions that we cover have allowed them to disintermediate, to go directly to the end consumer. And that is a trend that news organizations have to deal with. I would say that the, uh, so that's the technological uh, trend, I would say. The other one is this more of a societal one. It's a societal, political, economic one. And that is polarization, of course, which we've been talking about for a long time. And this polariz polarization of society has also led a lot of news organizations in order to tap into existing and new audiences to, they've had the pressure to polarize as well. And so that's a second big trend that I think is affecting the news industry. And again, the pandemic really has exacerbated this. So this is something that will affect the way that we are working in the future. Now we can come to this later, but I believe, and, and I think, you know, uh, you know, Julie, well, I'll let Julie speak for herself, but I think she's in the same sort of, you know, mindset as I, that it makes our roles ever more important. It makes the roles of the news agencies, trusted news agencies and news organizations ever more important. But we can certainly come back to that. In terms of ours, I wouldn't say that ours is quite a switch from B to B to B to C. Um, it is rather a, uh, we have a, a big B to B business. You know, we, just as a recap at Reuters, we serve uh, many of the big media organizations of the world, uh, and we also serve a financial uh, terminal. And that's the big difference, I think, between us and NAP. We also have the financial terminal aspect of our business. Then, as you say, in April, we also uh, relaunched our uh, website, and we're very excited about that. We are working on it uh, very hard. And so, yes, it is a, a part of a new uh, you know, B to C business. But I, I wouldn't say that it's, that it's a switch at this point. It is rather a new uh, area that we are investing in. Right. Let's go. Uh, let's go a little bit back to what you said about the technological uh, change when it comes to social media, when it comes particularly also to working with different platforms. Because of course, the whole lots of attention has been, and it's been more attention since the beginning of the pandemic to really big and trusted uh, media organizations and the brands. This is when we saw people more switching their attention also, for example, to public media, to big brands, to big agencies, because of the trust, definitely. But also, there is still this aspect, as you've just mentioned, when it comes to the social media as well, when it comes to working with different platforms, how to balance these 
the good and the bad while working with those platforms and how to balance and to make it, I, it's a very, very thin line, but how to find it and how to balance that one. Judy. I do think that it's a that it's a balance. You know, we at AP we do uh, work with some of the platforms, particularly focused on fact checking. You know, we we really pride ourselves on being a fact based news organization. Uh, we believe that is a, a great public service, and so we work with the platforms to provide fact checking information to try to ensure that there's a buffer between some of the misinformation that can speed through those platforms and get in front of millions of people quickly. Uh, so that is that is one aspect of our working relationship. At the same time, you know, we also are quite concerned about the disinformation that does spread through the platforms. Uh, some of the platforms are trying to take steps to, to address that, but I think that it does, as Alessandra said, it makes our role as credible fact-based news organizations more important than ever. Consumers, news consumers right now have so many choices, and they can actively choose to engage with news that, or with content, I should say, that will bolster what they already believe, that will uh, allow them to you know, live in, a, in an environment where they're not challenged, where they, where they don't have to, have to pressure test their ideas. And that, I think, is one of the great things that we can do as the media. We can put more facts in front of people. We can show different sides of an issue. And what I do worry about right now is that these algorithms, which are quite powerful, can block all of that out. They can, they can allow a, a, an audience member to only see information uh, that validates what they already believe. So I think one of our challenges is to continue to look for ways to get in front of that, to whether it is through partnerships uh, with the platforms, whether it is through uh, some of our own technology and our own products, constantly looking for ways to get facts in front of people. Because I personally happen to think that disinformation is uh, probably a, a top five challenge, uh, not just for the news organizations uh, that we represent here in our industry as a whole, but for democracies, uh, for you know so many of the things that we believe and I think that this is uh, this is one of our great challenges in the coming years. Alessandra. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I can't but agree, of course. I mean, we care very deeply uh, about fighting, uh, you know, disinformation. And as Julie says, you know, there, there there are different ways you can do this. I think there is the way that you can do this within our own news organization. So what we do every day with our news to make sure that it is really forged in that crucible of fact and when we put it out there ourselves. Then it, it is what we can do in initiatives with partnerships that we also do on on fact checking. So we have fact checking initiatives in many countries and in many languages uh, around the world. Uh, we, uh, at Reuters, we, we publish in English, but we also publish in many local languages. So we try to fight misinformation in, in different languages. And then there is a part that is education, that is media literacy. And I think that is very important because it is educating, in particular, the new generation of uh, consumers, audience, viewers. Uh, readers, you know, to try to to be able to distinguish between fact and fiction. So we also have a number of partnerships uh, to to improve uh, lit literacy, media literacy. I do think that this point on media literacy is so crucial. You know, everybody who's participating in this conversation knows, you know, what the AP is, knows what Reuters is, knows, you know, the other sort of major news outlets, but. And when you talk to a younger generation, uh, they're getting their news from TikTok. They're getting their news from you know sources that are unfamiliar to me in some cases. And we've got to try to make sure that we can bring them along, that we can show them not just the importance of the organizations that we represent, but the importance of the information that we're putting out there. I think that that's a challenge that we should all take on as news leaders. And let's discuss it. How exactly can we do that? How can we how can we speak to that audience? How can we speak to those news consumers? How we, can we speak to those who are on the platforms like, like TikTok? You've mentioned there are other platforms for when you talk about younger, for example, generations. Because of course this is a, this is a huge group of news consumers put in the way of our audiences that are there, but they are probably not that willing to go into the big brands and to watch traditional media. They are not there probably to to watch the primetime show in the evening, to consume the verified and branded, you know, the branded content. How do we communicate with them? How do we talk to them? I think, a, I think a lot of this, I think a lot of this is listening to them about where they are consuming news and how they are consuming news. And as I mentioned earlier, thinking about how we as news organizations 
look at not just the next six months or the next year, but the next five years? You know, what do we need to do on our end? Where do we need to be to reach that audience? I think that, uh, you know, we don't want to be in a situation where we're saying, this is how we will produce news. Come meet us here. We need to go out and actively meet them where they are. And in some ways, it's really exciting to think about different platforms, to think about different methods for storytelling. I've been really invigorated in a lot of conversations that I've had with younger people. Uh, they are creative. They are smart. They're engaging. And I think there's a lot that we can learn there. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a bit of a mindset change on a lot of legacy news organizations to, to be open-minded about, again, thinking about new approaches for delivering our content content to those younger audiences. Well, that's it. That's, that's an interesting thing about how to change that approach. Um, Alessandra, what's your take on that? What's yeah. how to bring well, them on okay. board? I think there is there is the how and there is the what. And I think I totally agree um, with Julie. The how is really important. The formats, the way in which you give information is changing and must change because it's being consumed in a different way. There is also the what. And the what lies in coverage that is more resonant, that makes more sense for a new generation. And we could spend the entire hour talking about this because there are many areas that 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 traditionally we haven't covered. The obvious one coming out of COP obviously is is climate. You know, climate is clearly not only affecting everything we do uh, in in our lives, it's clearly affecting the news industry as well. And it is an area that has huge interest among especially among a younger generation. Uh, sustainable investing is sustainable business. These are areas that we didn't you know, perhaps traditionally cover, and now we are spending a huge amount of resources on uh, covering. And then, of course, one really important part of this is the making sure that our newsrooms, and I know we're going to talk about this perhaps later, but making sure that our newsrooms reflect the world that is outside. And this gets us into the whole area of diversity and inclusion. And frankly, we are not able anymore to cover the world outside us if we inside do not look like that world. People, we will not be credible. Our, the, especially, you know, younger generations will just not think that we're serious unless we understand different topics and how different topics are changing and how we're covering them. Again, also another huge topic. But I think getting back to how you change that, I think it is the how, the how news is consumed, and that a lot of that has to do with formats. But it is also the what, the areas of coverage that we have to to take on, otherwise we're simply not credible anymore. Well, that's great. Let's actually go there in the details, because of, as you both have just said, when it comes to different format and different content for those younger generations or for younger, for different groups of news consumers, it's not only what goes there, it's also how it goes there, how this news is delivered, how this content is delivered. And then this content at the same time, those new stories, new formats, they quite often cannot be delivered by people who are probably not that much into those new formats. So that brings us to the newsroom, as you say, that have to represent the whole diversity and all the groups of our audiences. Let's talk about this diverse newsroom. Let's talk for, let's keep on for, for a second about this younger generation of viewers, right, of the consumer, of news consumers, because for us to be able, for all of us in the industry, to be able to produce the content for them, that content has to be produced by people who are also of the same generation, of the same views, of the same take on those things. Is that the case? Or, for example, can we take rather traditional, more seasoned and probably experienced journalists and ask them to go in completely different formats? Well, I would just say that some of our uh, more experienced journalists at the AP, and I'm sure it's the same at Reuters too, are also among our most creative and also among our most committed to ensuring that we are growing our audience and reaching a new news consumers. So I don't think it's a matter of saying that the only people who can reach a younger audience are going to be younger, younger journalists. Uh, I've seen just tremendous enthusiasm and creativity from our more experienced staffers. But I do think that having diversity in all of the senses, right? It's, it's 
ethnic diversity, it is gender diversity, it is age diversity, it's diversity of experience. You know, that's really what we're talking about here. We want to be in a position where the conversations that we're having internally in our newsrooms, in our uh, news departments, on our teams, uh, are reflective of the audiences that we're aiming to reach. And so the more diversity you have on the inside, the, you would hope that the more diversity you'll have among, among your audience. Uh, but I think that so much of this is about just having that conversation internally, learning from each other as journalists. I've had, as I've taken on this role in the last few months, I've had just terrific conversations with my colleagues around the world. I learn so much from them every day. And I think that has helped me think about our audience in a broader way. Uh, I think that, you know, every day I learn something from a from a colleague and it gives me new perspective on a, on a story. So again, I think thinking about diversity in the broadest sense of the word uh, is really what we're after here. I yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, but I, and I would add one thing. Understanding the world outside you and learning how to cover it better does not mean taking a point of view. And in fact, in many cases, in journalism writ large, you do not want somebody who has a very strong point of view on something to actually cover that something. So I, I agree with Julie. It's about it's about um, you know a, a you know thinking about just diversity writ large, but also being careful not to be crusaders. You know, we are not crusaders in you know we are not cultural warriors here. You know, we are you know, fact based reporters who try to get to the truth and by the way realize that often uh, one can make mistakes and that sometimes we are recording a first draft of history not the final draft and so if a mistake is made that that needs to be corrected and i think that brings us back i think to that issue we started with which is trusted information which i believe is actually a commercial opportunity including for younger generations because you know they 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 don't muck around i mean they they want to know what's what and they want news that is useful to them and that is helping them make decisions so I, I just think we have to guard against sort of point of views um, and, and, and really try to get to understand what is going on. Let's go into more diversity uh, in the newsroom in general. And the most obvious question and the comment I'm going to have from myself, let's imagine that I'm sending that in the Q&A box of our conversation right now. Uh, for me personally, something that is very close and dear to my heart is to have this conversation with two female leaders of the news industry. Now, that is absolutely great, but we still, I think we will agree here that probably when it comes to women in news, there's still a little bit more to do. Oh, I think that's absolutely true. And I and I think it's fabulous to be having this conversation uh, with, with two women and thrilled uh, that Alessandra is taking on this role as the first woman to, to lead Reuters. Uh, you know, my experience at AP has been a bit different. I'm the third woman in a row to serve as executive editor of the AP. Uh, Daisy Beresingham, our new in incoming president and CEO, first woman to take on that role. Uh, but we don't want to rest on our laurels, you know, at the AP or anywhere in the industry. I think for every woman uh, that ascends to one of these uh, to one of these positions, we certainly uh, should cheer it on and then look for the women that we're bringing up behind us, a uh, push to ensure that women have more of a seat at the table. I think that, and I'm sure Alessandra has had this experience, it is different when there is a woman who is in the room. It is a different conversation that is fostered. And, and to tie this into our earlier discussion on diversity, I, I think about that so often. I think about individual discussions that I have been in and how I know that my voice has shaped it, pushed it in a direction that I felt was important. And when I look around a table or increasingly these days, a, a Zoom box, I think about who's missing and who should be in that conversation and how that conversation would look differently if we had more diversity. And I think, again, it, it's, it's a matter of celebrating our victories when they come at, because they're hugely important, but continuing as, as leaders in this space to push for more. Alison. Yeah, uh, two things I would say. Um, one is actually just pivoting off what Julie was saying about when she looks around a room and she asks who's missing. So I think one of the things that we are trying to do at Reuters is do the same thing when we uh, are taking a picture or filming video or doing a story. 
which voice is missing here and is it an important voice? And did we quote this person just because it was the easy way and we've been quoting this person for, you know, as long as we've been in this job and we didn't really stop to think as to whether this person brings in a new perspective. And so we've sort of launched this initiative, which is essentially about going back and revisiting all our sources to make sure that they are refreshed and they are representative. So I, I, I it, it, interesting, it made me think of it when, when Julie said about looking around the room, virtual or otherwise. But the other point is, you know, I read um, recently a, a, a quote by Sally Ride, who was the first um, American woman in space. And in this interview, she's saying, you know, I didn't go into space because I wanted to be a role model. Uh, but it was clear to me after my first trip into space that I had become a role model. And that became important to me, she said, because people cannot be what they cannot see. And I think that sort of sums it up. That is why we need uh, more women in senior positions, because it is an incentive and hopefully an aid for uh, younger women who, who have the ambition. Certainly. I have a comment here. It's not a question, but it's a comment that would really add into this, uh, into this conversation from Amy Sowen. Uh, diversity of thought is what is most necessary. Different educational backgrounds, different political beliefs, religious beliefs or non-beliefs, socioeconomic background. That's, um, Amy, that's exactly what, uh, that, that's absolutely the conversation that we are having here. The only reason why I use this opportunity to, um, to specify a little bit the fact that we do have two female leaders of the industry uh, and that's that's a great thing and of course this it doesn't mean that we did get to full for example gender equality at, in this industry as in any other industry but we're getting there hopefully and I want to that's why I wanted to emphasize that at the same time um, there is a bit of a negative thing to it as well it's on the more you know on the online harassment and unfortunately this is something that some of your uh, younger female colleagues and journalists, reporters from your teams have been experiencing more quite a lot. This is an important conversation to have among among you here, among everybody following it, among everybody following this conversation on news exchange, but also for anybody who is already in the industry or who is about to go into that, uh, into news and to start the career there. Julie. I think you're absolutely right, Sasha. This is one of the conversations that we need to have. And I've been really proud over the last couple of months of conversations that we've been having at the AP. You know, online harassment, I think, is now something we have to take as seriously as we have long taken physical safety uh, for our staff. You know, we've been very good over the years at ensuring that when we're sending journalists into conflict zones or other uh, dangerous assignments that they're well prepared for it. I think we've been less well prepared in terms of making sure that our staff has resources and training to deal with the attacks that they're facing online. And those attacks increasingly are focused on women, on, on journalists of color, uh, and they can cover any manner of topics. It's, you know, sometimes we think about this, particularly in the US, just around the political space, but really almost any topic we've seen can generate just an enormous amount of, of, of hate and vitriol online. So we have spent the last several months um, having uh, numerous conversations among our staff internally. We've had a terrific team of journalists leading an effort to create um, a new uh, response plan at AP, a new training effort at AP. Uh, I hope that we can be a leader in the industry in helping other news organizations uh, tackle this growing problem. There are a lot of resources that are already available, uh, and we're, we're really looking to uh, you know, make sure that we can make those resources more accessible to our, to our staff. But it's the kind of thing that, again, I think we need to talk about more openly. I think we need to make sure that people know, you know our journalists know, when they are facing this kind of attack, you know, we will have their back. We will we will provide them with the same kind of support again that we would for a journalist who's going into a, a traditional conflict zone because that is that is the new world that we live in and and I think you know I have I have faced a lot of this myself uh, certainly when I was a reporter um, but even in in this job and it can be scary and it can feel really isolated you can feel very alone on this and we we do want to make sure that our that our journalists know just how supported they are and just how many resources are at their disposal. That's what we discussed here also prepping for this session and for this conversation and I, I said that it was uh, it's particularly hard probably for the young the younger you are and the, you know whenever you're rather in the beginning I mean it's always 
feeling horrible to get something like that. But when specifically when you're younger and probably a bit less experienced to to see anything written like that, any online harassment, that's when you are even more vulnerable because then probably you kind of sometimes you just prefer even to ignore, which you should not be doing, but just for your sanity. Alessandra, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I can't but agree with Julie. I mean, clearly it's a it's it's a huge issue. It is uh, growing and it is one of the issues that affects the mental health of the people who are on uh, the end of it. Uh, and th we also are focusing on the areas that Julie talked about. Uh, one is uh, training, uh, you know, just like we, uh, you know, send uh, people, we train people who go into conflict jo zones because we uh, we uh, worry about their pers their physical safety. We have to worry about their uh, mental safety as well, and so training is a big. Uh, part of it and also part of that training is being prepared that this might happen telling people what to expect that this is likely to happen because in the world of today this is likely to happen and then like Julie support that the organization is behind you and supports you and supports the reporting that you've that you've been doing and this is something I agree that that we you know that we need to that we need to talk about then in some cases when it gets extreme you know you have to take even further steps such as go to uh, local authorities uh, you know because the, the 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 harassment could lead to then also a physical danger so there's a whole gamut of, of things that we can uh, and should do yeah and, that's... and I think this really does tie into the conversation that we were having about having younger journalists on staff you know I don't want this to be something that 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 scares younger journalists away from this business. I want this to be something where they can join news organizations and know that the, that they'll have support. But on the organization side, you know, we need to be prepared as we hire more young journalists. These are people who have lived their lives online. Unlike myself or Alessandra, you know, I didn't grow up and thank goodness, you know, with a Twitter account or a Facebook account or Instagram. Younger journalists have, ha they're used to having a presence online. It's important to them to have a voice online. And I think that there's benefit for our journalism in ensuring that that can continue, but we have to help them be prepared for what, what could happen when you are active on social media, when you do have that public presence there, uh, what, what could happen there and make sure that, that they know that we want to encourage them to have that presence still uh, in line with our values as a news organization. And then we will support them when it, do, when the blowback, uh, you know, does, does happen which is all too often these days yeah it's about them feeling that they're not alone and that and things can be done and will be done and there are, there are organizations and teams standing by them if and when that happens um let's let's go into a bit of a, into another question uh alessandra you mentioned that serious journalism uh, is a business opportunity that comes very much in line with the recent statement by the times editor-in-chief who described I'll quote in here, uh, the present moment is a golden age for serious journalism. That is indeed, of course, when it comes to the experience and the whole weight of news and fact checking and everything you bring to the table. But also uh, there have been some questions about whether journalism, news journalism, uh, could go more, for example, human. And that's something when it comes to of course, we go to the conversation, it is not about facts versus opinion, but it's about more of a human aspect in some cases. And one of the great examples that could be given now, which we probably can discuss, and of course, bring any example you want, but the first thing that comes to my mind nowadays would be, for example, vaccination campaigns and the way this subject is covered. Julie, what's your take on that? No, absolutely. Look, people have to be at the center of so much of what we are reporting. You know, we are writing for for an audience uh, of people. We want to make sure that their stories, their personal stories, you know, are at, are at the core of this. Obviously, there are uh, policy debates to cover, economic policy, uh, you know, foreign policy to cover. But ultimately, all of these policies do impact people. So I think it's a conversation we have. We have often, you know, how are we going to tell this story through the prism of the people who are being affected by it? I think on, on the vaccines, you know, in particular, you know, we've, we've told stories about uh, parents, you know, who are desperate to get their children vaccinated. We've also told stories about parents who are worried about getting their children vaccinated. We have told uh, just incredible stories during the pandemic about families, you know, who were unable to see 
elderly relatives separated in those early scary months uh, of the virus. And so, you know, I, I think that those can be some of the most rewarding uh, stories that we cover. They, they have been, I think about Emilio Morinati, one of our uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photographers in Spain, who, if you haven't seen his imagery from the beginning of the pandemic, it was just extraordinary. And it was all focused on people, the individual experiences of uh, people who were suffering again in those in those early scary days when we didn't know where this would go. So uh, I'm hugely proud of the work that we have done there. And I think it's important for us, you know, anytime we're having a conversation that does focus on the policy or the politics or the, the governments who are who are driving um, agendas to think about the people who are on the other end. Alessandro, what's your yeah, take I on mean, this? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, look, whereas I do see sort of a conflict between fact and opinion uh, or or fact, uh, you know, and and uh, and misinformation, I, I don't see a, a conflict between fact and, and humans and, and human stories. Uh, you know, I think ultimately, if you look at it at the very, at the most simple level, uh, you know, information and news helps people make decisions. And when people make decisions, especially when it's decisions that are about themselves or their family members or their uh, local communities or even their countries or their companies, they need information that they can rely on. And as Julie said, this information is being consumed by people. Now, the human story is the way you make it digestible. It is the vehicle, uh, you know, to news a, a very news term. It is the vehicle through which you make the story more interesting or attractive and draw the consumer, the viewer, the reader in because they might think, gosh, the same thing as the, the person who is speaking or the person who is quoted happens to me. But I don't see a, a, a conflict between, you know, telling telling a fact-based story and telling it in a you know through a human point of view for a human and I think the other thing I would just add to this is, you know, look, we don't want to uh, shape people's opinions. As Alessandra said, you know, we're not we're not looking to push people in a certain direction. But I do think that one of the things that stories that are really focused on the human experience can do is they can help explain to people why other people feel differently than them. I, I think there's there we're, we live right now increasingly, you know, physically where we live, where we live in an online space. We we increasingly are living in bubbles, and anything we can do to shed a little bit of light on why someone might feel differently, why they may have come to a different conclusion around something, I think is really important. I think it also um, it helps us try to explore what we've been talking about with disinformation. You know, how do people fall into these uh, in, in, into into these disinformation bubbles? How do people get consumed by misinformation? Uh, trying to, again, not make a value judgment on this, but just through reporting, through fact-based reporting, explore how this can happen, explore how people can be pushed in this direction. I think there's a lot of power in doing that. Yeah, that's that's what that's what I uh, th that's what I meant about rather the human. It obviously when it comes to news, you cannot put uh, news versus facts versus opinions, but it's about the probably humanizing sometimes the stories when when there is a lot to humanize there. Oh, there yeah, absolutely I mean, is. Look, I mean, the I, world not, is full um, of amazing yeah. stories. Go ahead, Alessandra. Uh, no, I I, I, I I totally agree. I mean, another thing, another area that we um, are investing in is is taking stories from uh, people who are on the ground. So using user generated content. So from people who are on the ground in a place where we are not, we are in many places, but we can't be everywhere. And so we are using content uh, by, you know, citizen journalists, if you will, we are verifying them, fact-checking them, and then and then using them, and that is another way to to you know show what is going on uh, you know on the ground due you know, to people on the ground. Did it? You wanted to. Oh, no, I would just, I would agree with that. Like I said, I think the world is full of amazing stories. And I think that, you know, it, it, to me, that is just as a journalist, it is just one of the, the, the most fun parts of this job yeah. is to get to find and reveal one of those just interesting human stories. And we find, uh, you know, when we talk to our customers, when we 
uh, look at our audience metrics, you know, people gravitate toward those stories. Uh, sometimes it's because they're they're uplifting stories, and I think we all could agree that we could use a little more of that, uh, you know, in the in the news ecosystem these days. Uh, but again, I think that human experience it's so powerful, and it's it's such a draw. And I think we have to we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. Again, when we get really focused on the policymakers and the politics and sort of the big forces at play, uh, that 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 there's there's you know there's still a great human story out there behind almost every topic area. Now you both said that yeah the world is full of uh, good, great, kind, and uplifting stories. And on this one, let me ask you both a question. And it's great to have you here with me on the screen back because when discussing and prepping for this panel, as a team here with News Exchange uh, guys, uh, all of our friends or family members who are not in news industry had one question. Why do newsmakers love to scare people? Tragedy, drama, apocalypses, driving news avoidance. Is there a different way to do news? Uh, that's a few of us have received that question when we asked for their opinion and on what would you ask from the news? Julie, we want to take start here. <laughs> that's a really great question. Um, you know, I <laughs> I think about that a little bit when I, I think about the opening um, weeks and months of the pandemic, because you know, particularly I think in the United States where we were right in the middle of a presidential campaign as this was as this was happening, uh, you sort of saw politicians go to two uh, extremes. One was the uh, this is fine, it's basically like the flu, don't worry about it too much, and then to counter that. You had, um, you know, in some cases, more extreme rhetoric about the dangers of it, and and the truth was, you know, probably somewhere in in, in between here. Look, I think that. I think that we as a news industry just need to focus on the facts, right? I mean, our job is not to go out and scare people. It's not to make everything uh, look like doom and gloom. It's not to uh, you know, put a negative lens on everything. But there are some situations in the world that are quite grim and we should be accurate and fact-based when we are covering those. We should also make sure that we're that we are not uh, overshadowing where there are positive trends, where there are, is good news to tell. We've certainly had pockets of that during the pandemic. We've talked about this a bit in our in our coverage of climate change. You know, how do we focus for as for as many scary facts and uh, and really dire predictions as there are out there? Uh, on the impact of climate change. There are also people around the world who are doing incredible things to try to enact change here, to try to advance you know, policies to counteract climate change. Let's focus on them a little bit too. Again, it's not to not to say that that is uh, you know, an optimistic story in totality, but it is a multi-layered story. And I think that needs to be uh, at the core of what we're doing. Alessandra, I'm sure you've heard that question before as well. Uh, yes, I mean, look, I think our role is to be a mirror, right? We are a mirror for the world. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, good things go on in the world, sometimes bad things go on in the world, and, and we need to be there uh, because we need to bear witness to what is going on. So th that that is what I believe. This being said, uh, I can concede that sometimes we journalists, you know, will will tend to always, in going after the story, you know, that, that will will sometimes, you know, be more attracted perhaps to, you know, the, the, the negative story or the, um, you know, where can we uncover something, you know, terrible um, than maybe tell about, you know, the, the, the great thing that, that is going on. I, I will concede that there is some of that and some of that is very important. But what I also think is important is where there is something, uh, you know, whether it, it's positive or creative or new or uh, a pocket of, uh, of beauty of some sort, and we can cover it and then explain why it's important, what it tells us about the world, I think that that is very important. I mean, you look in business, right? I'm, I come from the business reporting world. And sometimes really successful business stories can actually tell you a lot about what is going on in a particular industry. They teach lessons. You know, I, I often think that we have to look for teachable moments because one microcosm can tell you a lot about what is going on elsewhere. So I think that, you know, that is also important. And just, you know, to what um, Julie was saying about the pandemic, I mean, some of the, uh, much of the coverage during the pandemic also 
uh, we wrote about and we shot and we took videos about human initiatives that, that really showed how the human spirit tried to shine through. So everything from the little gestures of clapping for health systems around the world, or perhaps tennis, you know, being played um, on two rooftops when everybody was in lockdown. You know, just like Ju Julie was mentioning, you know, um, the, the efforts by people, you know, around the world to try to clean up their uh, their towns, um, you know, and, and just do their bit, uh, you know, for making the environment that little bit better. I think that those stories we do cover, and, um, y you know, we cover them because they are notable, and because if it's being done in one part of the world, then, you know, it's likely to be done in, in another part of the world. But ultimately, our role is to bear witness to what is going on in the world and to be a mirror, and I think we always need to remember that. And that's exactly what's going to be my next question, and that's going to be the final one for me, because I still have to keep some time for an audience question and answer session. If you're joining us online, if you're following this session, this conversation, please join in. I'll be part of it. You can ask us questions. I do receive some of them, but keep them coming. Uh, they are all here, and we're going to get into them just in a few min minutes. And before that, um, I've got a question, and I want you to see this tweet on screen. We do have it ready. This is by Jay Rosen, who is teaching journalism at NYU. I often ask journalists why they chose journalism. Top answers over 30 plus years. I like to write, make the world a better place, give voice to people who lack it, hold power accountable, license to be curious and ask questions, see the world or something new every day day. Uh, these are the seven reasons by Jay and the people and the journalist he's heard from in 30 plus years. Now, I want to hear from both of you. I do understand that you will tell me that this is the combination of those things, of course, that brought you to this job. Um, but among those factors, now where you are leading roles in the industry, I want to hear from you not probably what brought you here, but what keeps you here in this industry years later? Julie, what keeps you here? That's a great list from Jay, and, and I agree. It's a little bit of all of that that, that brought me uh, into journalism. And I would say, you know, what, what keeps me here and what I hope keeps me here for um, a really long time is I think what we do is essential. I think it is vital. I think that, you know, I, I've always wanted to have a career, and I know so many journalists feel this way, where, where you have impact, and I can't think of any better way to have impact than to do fact-based journalism that does give voice to people who, who otherwise wouldn't have it and can hold powerful people and powerful interests accountable. It's, it's something I wake up every morning really passionate about. Uh, I'm so proud to lead a team of journalists who feel the same way. Uh, and and uh, I, I believe um, that there's power in what we do. I know that it can be hard to see that sometimes. I, I know that, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like the media is, um, you know, the boogeyman, the bad guy in the room. But I believe that we have impact. I believe I believe strongly in that. Um, and that is that is what keeps me going. Alessandra, what keeps you here? <laughs> Yeah, well, that is a great list, I agree, and it is a combination of all. I think um, uh, holding power accountable is perhaps the one that uh, that, uh, that I would put um, perhaps, uh, you know, before others, and I think that's a great responsibility that we have. It is a great mission, and I think we also have to do it with humility, and I think one of the reasons that there has been a uh, lack of an increasing lack of trust in news organizations, as as Julie said, the boogeyman. I think is because too often we journalists we put ourselves as the story, we make ourselves the story, and I think we have to have the humility to say no. It is not about us. It is about those whom we cover. It is about those people, and that would be the second one that I would say who do not have a voice and who who it is important to give them a voice. But I think we have to recognize all the time that we are fallible ourselves and that we have to do this job with great 
humility. Um, I too am extremely proud and happy every single day uh, to be running this organization. It is really the great honor of my life. So um, I'm just excited about it really all the time. Um, so that keeps me here. Thanks so much for these answers. And uh, we are going to get some questions from uh, people joining us online in this conversation. And we have a question in the Q&A box by Christian Aurora. Julie, that's for you. Uh, I'm going to read it here. I liked Julie's focus for AP on global inequality through the pandemic. AP and organizations like The Guardian seem to have a more international approach than national public service media, which tends to follow rather national government uh, messaging. A global approach to the pandemic is essential. Now, that's the comment from Christian. My question here would be to you, Julie, and then I would like to ask Alessandra as well. How often uh, taking a global look and a global perspective on things helps you deliver that news better and probably fuller? Well, I would say that one of the things that we have learned from the pandemic, and again, it's a, it's, it's a unique story, certainly, uh, because the world was experiencing, you know, one virus all at the same time. But, but I think one of the takeaways from our coverage of the pandemic is that taking that global look, uh, trying to see the ways in which storylines or themes uh, are being experienced uh, in different places of the world, you know, there's real power in that. Uh, it's, it's prompted us to think more broadly, you know, about how we tackle a story. It's prompted us to, you know, part of our earlier discussion to think about what aren't we talking about in this conversation? You know, I've been particularly proud of work we have done focused on women in Africa and the impact of, of the pandemic on them in particular. You know, really just beautiful, uh, you know, really insightful work there. You know, that is, um, that's something that I think that we can do as a global news organization. And so I want my lesson coming out of the pandemic is to look for more opportunities to think about stories as global in nature. Now, that's not always going to be the case. You're not, you're not always going to end up in a situation uh, where you're able to to tell a story, you know, from so many corners of the world, because sometimes it is more of a national story, or it, or it is more of a local story. In those cases, you want to think about the global audience, right? What can we do in that story that is, you know, part of one country's uh, fabric that is relevant to an audience outside of that country? Uh, but again, I do think that there's real power in the ability to take that global lens on a major issue. Alessandra. Yeah, I mean, I call Reuters uh, global. Not the most beautiful name, but certainly it matches who we are. We are certainly an extremely global news organization uh, working in 200 locations, but we are also very local. And that means that we have local language reporters who know their territories, who understand them, and who can report effectively in them, and who, and who then uh, write in that language. And I think that combination allows us to have real insight in what is happening in the world for the local audience and for the global audience. The pandemic is a perfect example. This virus is global, and it is affecting everybody around the world in pretty much the same way, health-wise. Obviously, inequalities change that equation, as, as Julie has said. But in addition to that, there are local stories that local governments have tried to hide about the spread of the pandemic, which to the global eye would have gone unnoticed unless there was somebody saying, hang on a second, let's fact check these numbers of this country. Let's fact check these numbers of this other country. And we went to great lengths to understand what was going on locally, so what was going on in different countries countries nationally in addition to the big picture of the pandemic. And so I think the, the pandemic is actually a perfect exa example of why combining that glo glo globality and locality into globality, <laughs> excuse the alphabet soup, uh, is, is so important. Um, you know, global news is important for, for people around the world. And if we go back to what I was saying before, which is that news ultimately should help people make better decisions. When you have a virus that is affecting people in different parts of the world, then something that is going on in one part of the world can actually be very instructive for the other side of the world. So this is our model, and I really believe in it, and we will continue doing so. And I've got one more question to both of you by Bartosz 
Lijbinski, apologies if I mispronounced that, uh, quality content producers operate in tough environment these days. And the question perhaps is how to secure ad revenue streams growth while intellectually improving content offering. This is the question that probably lots of, uh, that you hear a lot from your teams. Alessandro, do you want to start with this one? So essentially this is clickbait, right? How do you keep quality yep. high without following? You know, again, I go back to what I said before, that I believe that ultimately when there is a really important story that changes people's lives, people want to know the truth, the unvarnished facts. And that becomes a commercial opportunity. And I believe that the pandemic has shown us that. And going back to the second challenge that I was talking about earlier, which is that in this polarized world where everybody is, or many people are, cultural warriors, that actually sifting through all that and telling you what's what and giving it down the middle, that too is a commercial opportunity. Do you I would just add to that. Uh, yeah, I would just add to that that I think that you know that was certainly a choice that I think that some uh, you know digital news startups made, which was to try to uh, to uh, focus on more clickbait uh, content and headlines, and that hasn't actually always proven to be successful. We've seen uh, some outlets that that went that route who have struggled mightily, and I would say that some of that has been when moments like the global pandemic happened, and it turns out that people do want fact-based information. They do want to go to sources where they where they can trust, and they don't feel like uh, the headlines are all focused on just generating clicks. So, you know, look, this is a central challenge, and it's it's a real financial challenge, I think, for a lot of news organizations. But I wouldn't say that the the lessons uh, from the past few years, uh, you know, have all pointed in in one direction on that. And actually, to Alessandra's point, I think there is some real evidence uh, that high quality fact based journalism can draw an audience, which can then drive ad, ad revenue. Well, we have discussed some of the developments and the challenges that the news industry has industry has been going through over the past couple of years. And uh, when we meet here, but in person for the conversation at the News Exchange 22. Um, for this one, I want to have a closing statement for this year from both of you. What are those challenges that we're going to discuss and probably open up when we meet here in person for the next year news exchange? Alessandra, what's your take on what are the most burning upcoming challenges? I would say all of the above, but I would also say that in a year, both Julie and I will have been in our positions a little longer. And so I'm sure we will have lots of insights uh, for what is happening in uh, all of 2022. Oh, I really, I really, really can't wait to hear about those insights. You, I hope you're <laughs> going to share at least some of them with me and with all the teams here. Julie? <laughs> I agree. We will come with some. Maybe we'll keep a few secret. Uh, no, I think one of the challenges, and I and I hope we can all gather in person next year to talk about these, is uh, you know how we adjust in our newsrooms and, and our news organizations to to what is hopefully at that point more of a post-pandemic world. You know, trying to think about hybrid work. You know, how we keep the culture strong in our news organizations uh, as we return uh, in different models, in different ways of working than we than we did before. I'm really excited by some of those options. I find some of them to be a bit daunting, but I think that as news leaders, uh, there's a lot we'll be able to learn from each other uh, about how that process is working. And again, hope to be able to see everyone in person next year to have that conversation. Thanks so much. Alessandra Galoni, editor-in-chief at Reuters, and Julie Pay, senior vice president, executive editor at the Associated Press. Alessandra, Julie, thanks so much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.